Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your son, Jesus. We are thankful that it is in him that you show us how much you love, how vast, how high, how deep is your love for us. So, Father, this morning, as we listen to your word being read and being explained, pray, Father, Lord, that your spirit will continue to work in our hearts, in our mind, in our wills, that, Lord, that you will, uh, you will equip us to show this amazing love to the world around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Jason's going to come and read the Bible for us, and after that, Pastor Kel will bring God's Word. Thank you. Today's Bible reading is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 to 10. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Thanksgiving for the Thessalonians' faith. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imi imitators of us and of the Lord. For you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Before we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is God's word. Thank you for reading that great passage of scripture. Just one observation from yesterday, if I may. Uh, we uh, affirmed Tim McBride uh, Dr. Tim McBride as the new principal, and uh, so he's a, he will now be principal-elect until July, when Dr. Clifford uh, stands down. So pray for both Tim and Dr. Clifford. Uh, they are great men. Um, the big thing when you've been principal of a college for 27 years and seen the incredible growth and development of the college to step down, but I've been saying to my friend Ross, the best is yet to come. You know, this has been a great journey up until now, but listen, the next step, the next stage is the best. And I've been encouraging Tim to look at the model that you have and uh, follow that, uh, but be your own person. God will develop you. And pray for those two men because both have been strategic and both have a, a strategic future in their ministry to other people. Let me pray, can I? Father, we pray that you will make your presence felt this morning in each of our hearts and minds. Thank you for this wonderful story that we've read 
and all of its implications to us today. Help us, Lord, to embrace the possibilities that each of us can share Jesus with lost people. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one of the pastors I mentor in Uganda is a man called Amos. And uh, a little while ago, I remember, we sent out a prayer note that in one of the churches that they had planted in Congo had been bombed and a whole bunch of people were killed. Um, and uh, I remember the days following that, that uh, I was Zooming with them most days for two or three days. How do you do 60 funerals? How do you do that with love and grace towards the people who perpetrated this? And uh, it was a great time of testimony and impact. And uh, over 150 people came to faith as a result. Um, they did then a 10-week discipling program, not just two or three hours once a week, but one whole day every week. They came and did discipling. And then last week, I got some photos of baptisms uh, of these people who uh, were being baptised in the river uh, and rejoicing. 300 people came to the baptism. And as a result, over 50 people came to faith. And uh, so he said, we'll start the discipling program all over again. And then he wrote these words. I am so thankful to Jesus. My heart overflows with worship and it sings with joy. Think about this for a moment. I am so grateful to God. My heart overflows with the sense of the wonder of what God is doing. My heart sings for joy. The scripture says there is joy in heaven over one person who comes to faith in Jesus. And here's this lovely man who failed his English test to get into college. But over the last six years that we've been working together, five and a half years, they have planted over 50 churches. And uh, so constantly we're getting this kind of, we, my heart sings. I love what God is doing. What's happening in his life? Jesus is absolutely first, absolutely committed to the kingdom. And that's spilling over uh, into his leadership and those uh, who are also his children. And my grandchildren, he keeps telling me. Um, now, I've been asked to speak this morning on how to share the gospel. And I said to my pastor, in one message, you're asking me to talk about how to share the gospel. Uh, I'm going to do my best this morning, but you're going to get sort of some gospel, but also illustrations and some encouragement to share uh, the gospel. In my last time, as a result of uh, what Pastor Dylan asked me to do, when I went on my treat last, retreat last time, I read through First Thessalonians with this question in mind. How did Paul and his team share the gospel, and what did that actually look like? So I read through 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, and, and I've started to put together a series for Fiji uh, when I'm there in September. Uh, but it resonates with my heart, and I want to just share the embryo of some of that this morning. Um, in this chapter, there's a beautiful overview of what God has done that's helpful to us in understanding the gospel. But there are three things I want you to keep in your mind. Firstly, we must have a good understanding of our faith. We must be able to articulate what we actually believe and what is amazing to me is how few Christians in churches could actually explain why they believe what they believe. We believe, for example, the Bible is the word of God. Um, could we tell us, could we explain why we believe that? Uh, we're doing that in the prison this afternoon. Uh, last time we were there, 
a group of men who made professions of faith began to say, well, how do we know the Bible's the word of God? So I said, okay, next time we come, we'll just explain and develop that. Uh, but could you explain that? Well, why do you actually believe in God and what kind of God is he? Uh, if somebody challenged you with that, what would you say? And I have to tell you that uh, I speak certainly every week with somebody who's not a Christian and no church connection. And I'm constantly asked, well, why do you believe in God? What kind of God is he? And uh, you don't believe the Bible. I mean, it's been written and rewritten so many times. You could, uh, it can't be true. What do you say to that? So we need to understand why we believe. What makes Jesus so unique among all the gods? Do we really believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Could we say why we believe in the resurrection of Jesus? And these guys last time we were in, at Windsor, uh, yeah, yeah, we believe in the resurrection, but couldn't see the inconsistency of believing that and, and not believing Jesus was the unique Messiah. So how do you deal with that? You see, so it seems to me that what I'm challenging you here this morning is to get on a journey. Begin to think about what you believe and why. And if you really want to follow this through a little bit, um, I teach a series called Christian Foundations. There are nine studies, and we are prepared to make that available to anybody who will commit to reading it and comprehending it. So I've just taught it at... Um, Pacific Hills Christian School and they're turning it into a, a YouTube thing what do they call that at any rate that's, that's coming but um, it can be it will be accessed but we'll make it available if you really want to get to understand what you believe and why and, and what it will do is incredibly help you to share your faith I suspect we hesitate a little bit what if they ask me a question I can't answer what will I then do. So firstly, understand what you believe and why. Secondly, what we believe should be evident in our lives. It's no good me sharing the gospel if I, the gospel hasn't changed me. You see, the gospel is transforming. If any person is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away and all things, that is the old moral and spiritual condition of being lost and separated from God is gone. And there's this new relationship with God that God has recreated within me, this new spiritual life and there's a new life emerging and that becomes evident to those around and often that's what solicits the questions. Often that gives the opportunity. And thirdly, very simply, learn to love people. Now, at the expense of embarrassing Tony, um, I watch Tony at jail, and he goes to jail once a month, and, and I watch him with the other, not necessarily the guys who want to come and study, but the the guys who are just coming in for afternoon tea. And because he loves them, they respond. And we get these guys who have become Christians and they absolutely respond to love. I was at, we've got one of the guys now, last week, on day release, coming to jail, uh, coming to, prison, to college, it's almost like jail or college. No, it's not. <laughs> but coming to college. And it's, it's been such an exciting week. All the, you imagine being in jail 15 years, coming by train to Macquarie, all the firsts, all the things that you've never had opportunity to do before, like pressing the button on the traffic lights. Or there was a silver button, there was something else apparently once, or, or having lunch with people who weren't in uniform. 
having sweets, ice cream. Hadn't had ice cream for 15 years. Going to chapel for the first time. Hearing the Bible expounded, people singing. All the jail songs are written by the jail guy. They're fantastic songs. But coming into a new world, and all of this is new, and the incredible thing about it, he's loved by people at the college. It's just been a great journey. You see, love people. God loves people. The scripture says, if you don't love your brother, you don't love God. The more you love God, the more you love your brother. Now, they're the core things that are going to come out of this uh, passage of scripture uh, today. The incredible thing here is to watch the journey. Paul and his team arrived at Thessalonica, and we read about it in Acts 17, and they went into the uh, temple, as was their uh, pattern, and for three consecutive Sundays and through the week, they taught the scriptures, they taught the gospel. Uh, he came in and they went into the synagogue on a three Sabbath days, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. And I imagine how he would do that. He would say, well, what about the resurrection? He would go to the Old Testament. When Paul was converted, he spent three years in the desert reading the only Bible they had, which was the Old Testament. And because the Old Testament is about the gospel, about the promise of the coming Messiah, and all of the things that we read explained in the New Testament were foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And Paul, that was his message. And he's with this group of people in Thessalonica. And then you read this. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas and did a large number of God-fearing Gentiles and quite a number of prominent women. You see this group, you see this lovely mix of people who came to faith. And then as you begin to read the story of Thessalonica, great persecution happened because the priests were angry and they began to persecute. And, uh, so, and that was common. So Paul is writing to a church that came to faith, a group, a large group of people, quite a mixture group of people, and they began to live out the gospel that was uh, explained to them. Now, the more you understand and believe the greater the capacity to explain that. I imagine that three weeks in the synagogue, the people observed Paul and his team and watched how they lived. They would have explained about the fall. Uh, they would have explained about the, the lostness of the fall. What actually happened at the fall? Uh, we've got a young man that I mentor at Macquarie University. Yeah, I've been a Christian about three years, I think he's been. And uh, I was with him a month ago, and he said to me, I've got to go and tell my story at Trinity Chapel. Will you come? And I, I had some other appointments, and I thought, uh, I, so I said to him, look, how long will it be? He said, look, they said I'm on first. So I said, okay. So I sent a little note to the guys that I was meeting at, uh, at West Drive and went and I was glad I went because this young man stood up and he explained his journey where he'd been totally lost messed up his life in an incredible way and uh, then observed another fellow who was a Christian began to question that guy the guy began to engage him in study and eventually he came to faith and he said this. The transformation began when I recognised that I was a member of the kingdom of darkness. He said, you, see what, you know what happened at the fall? He's saying to their students, you know what happened at the fall? Uh, he said, Satan submitted, uh, rather Adam submitted to Satan. On our behalf, he submitted to another authority that was anti-God. 
And he became a member of the kingdom of darkness. And he said, when I realized I was a member of the kingdom of darkness, I thought, I do not want to stay here. So he began to think about this. What does it mean to become a member of the kingdom of light? And then he read Acts 2, where the apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, God has made this same Jesus both Lord and Christ. And he said, I submitted to Jesus as Lord. And he said, you know, all I had to do was to continue to grow to know Jesus. And God did the rest. Now, we know this young man, some of us here, and uh, he just lives Jesus. God has done a very special thing uh, in his life. And the, just think for a moment, when you think about Paul sharing with the Thessalonians, how would he have done that? He would have gone to the Old Testament, but then he would have perhaps quoted what he wrote in Romans, that God beforehand affirmed, promised the gospel through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So what he's saying, the Old Testament constantly affirmed the gospel. Then he would have said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's God's authority, God's power, the basis upon which God forgives and brings you into his kingdom. So understand the message of the gospel. Then we read our gospel came not in word only, but in great power, the word means authority, and in the Holy Spirit. So I want you to imagine that for a moment. Uh, sometimes when you share the gospel with people, there comes a point when you see God at work. I was getting a bone scan uh, you know, you get that when you get older, they send you a note and say it's time you had a bone scan to see if your bones are thin or whatever and so forth. And so I booked in and found myself in a line with people. And when you're in a line with people, you think, what a good opportunity. How can I engage the guy in front of me? And uh, so I, I've got a simple little strategy. Are you local? He said, yeah, yeah, I've been in this area all my life. What about you? Yeah, I've been in this area. Bought a house here in 1970, what, 78, something like that. We bought it. 49,000. I said, oh, that was good, boy. That was a good buy. You made some money on your investment there. We had the little chat together. And then I said to him, what do you do? He said, oh, I'm a retired barrister. What do you do? Well, that's easy then. I say, well, I mentor emerging leaders. Oh, what kind of emerging? Well, Christian leaders. Ah, oh. I could see him start to tune out. And I said, tell me where you're, you practiced your craft as a barrister. He said, oh, Selborne Chambers. I said, I knew a man in that, in that place. Told him his name. And he said, oh, yeah, I know that guy. He's religious. I said, no, he wasn't. He said, yeah, yeah, he's very rich. Went to church all the time. All the time talked about religion. I said, no, no, he wasn't religion. I, I think you've actually got the wrong concept. He said, no, I know he was religious. I said, look, I know him very well. He's been a very good friend over a long time. He's not religious. Religion is when you do things in order to gain a place of acceptance with God. Christianity is about a relationship with God. When you realise no matter how much you do, that's not the basis for acceptance with God. The basis for acceptance with God is what God has done in Jesus and the resurrection. And he said, oh, you believe in the resurrection? Absolutely, let me tell you why. So I listed off a bunch of reasons. He said, ah, oh, that makes sense. And then they called him, and I thought I wasn't finished. And they call this guy, and he goes in, and, he, and I'm next, so I don't have opportunity. So he came out, and he said, oh, it's good to meet you. We, uh, um, and I said, I'll tell you what to do. Why don't you give my friend a ring? He said, yeah, I can find him. I said, well, ring him and tell him you met me, and I'll guarantee you my friend will continue the conversation. It just... 
You know, you see, every opportunity, my prayer every morning is, Lord, make me aware of the opportunities today and give me wisdom in responding to those opportunities. And, I'm, and I'm, I pray for the Holy Spirit to make impact. So he says our gospel came not in word only, it was in word, but in the Holy Spirit and in great authority, great power. The Holy Spirit is at work every time we engage. My Fijian friends have a little, I think we gave it to them, and now they, it's a little mantra. They say, God is at work. God is at work. And, and they really see that. They say, and I think every time I share the gospel, God is at work. And we, we'll go this afternoon, we'll see God at work. And there will be an overflow. We'll begin to see the impact of that message in the lives of people. And that's what Paul did. Our gospel came not in word only, but in great authority. As you saw, the gospel actually worked in us. And then it says, you became followers of us and of the Lord. And you turn from idol to serve the living and true God. Whoops, hang on. You see, that's the core issue here. What were they doing? They were serving idols. They were part of the religious system in the temple. Uh, some of them would not have been there, but they would have heard Paul in the uh, outskirts or the outer courts of the temple and listened to the gospel. But he says, you turn from the old way of life that left God out of your life and God became central in your whole life and focus. And everybody saw that. So as we moved around the community that you live in, everybody kept talking about you. Just imagine that. Now, I get this story from Africa, from Amos and Joni in Ghana and Juliet uh, in Kampala. And, and they keep talking about the impact of the new Christians within their community. There's an area in Ghana where there's a spiritual awakening and there's 11 new churches, or there were 11 new churches. And my friend there, the group we're working with there, we're going to go and teach them, going to preach. I said, don't do that. They'll only remember 7%. That's what's going to happen today. I'm giving you about 100% and you'll go away with 7%. And I'm trying to determine which 7% you'll go away with. I want you to go away with knowing you've got to understand your message. Knowing you've got to live out the message. And knowing that to impact people with the message, you must love people. And that's what happened to this group of people. They were so impacted, their lives were so real, that people began to say, hey, what's, what's happened? What's happened to you, Ed? And they would say, well, Jesus made the difference. The gospel made the difference. The gospel's transformed. When God comes into your life, he transforms. You became followers of us and of the Lord. And you testified to that. And wherever we go and talk about Jesus, they say, oh, yes, we saw that. I want to just talk to kind of wrap it up about the main thing in sharing the gospel. It is about articulating truth. It is about understanding what you believe and why you understand what you believe. It is about living out the gospel. But what does that look like? What does that actually look like? I think one of the keys, and again, I said it earlier, in our ministry at prison, is that we love the guys. And when you see lost people, if you don't love them, you've got nothing to say to them. God so loved the world, he gave his son. And the Apostle Paul and their team were able to say, writing in chapter 2, we loved you so much, we were willing to die for you. 
we committed to you and cared for you as a mother caring for a nursing child. We've got a great grandson. And, uh, and he's not terribly interesting yet, because, but Jeanette absolutely wrapped in him, and so is my son. Uh, and I'm kind of thinking, well, I need you to talk to me a little bit and engage with me a little bit, and that will come. But he's got all of the potential, all of the possibilities. And he needs to be loved. And the more we love him, the more he will respond. And so when we go to jail this afternoon, those guys will read us. Are they just cons? Do we look at them negatively? Do we think we're better than them? Now, you listen to their songs. I wish I could remember some of the words, but they're unique, aren't they, Tony? They're just... You listen to these songs. I never heard songs like that before, written by the guys who have become Christians. It's incredible. Just even that's a blessing to me. Listen to their explanation of their circumstance and God's transformation in that circumstance. It's wonderful. And so we love them. That's what Paul experienced. He loved them. And the world doesn't function like this. I was really joy. I came away from our assembly yesterday with great joy, a great sense of God at work. Uh, and one of the things that excited me was to watch the young men that some of them we've invested in over time and others we know a little bit. Um, and uh, earlier, about a month ago, they kept coming, you've got to speak at assembly. And I said, no, I haven't. It's time you guys did it. I mean, they're coming up 30, 40, Delan's age, 50. And, and uh, I'm saying to them, it's time you got up and spoke. And yesterday they did. They did it with love and grace and authority. And it made an impact, didn't it, uh, what these young men did. And we as an emerging group here, we have an emerging group. There's always an emerging group. And our role is to love those who are emerging and invest in them. And then we see them emerge, and you know what they'll do? They'll imitate what they see in us. And that's happened to a new Christian. When a person comes to faith, they come into a church, and they think, what does a Christian in this church look like? And they look at how we function, how we live. Now, Tony and I, and AJ and Jen, the chaplain and his wife, are the only Christians some of those guys in jail have seen. Now, I've watched one of the guys come to college, and do you know how he functions? He expects a hug from everybody. Because we hug him, don't we? We hug him, he hugs us, Jen hugs him, Wally hugs him. He arrives at college and people say, they bit terrified of this guy. <laughs> but he's so warm that God has done such a transforming work in him that already people are saying, wow, what a lovely man. Uh, one of Jeanette's friends sat with him for lunch and he saw her thinking, should I sit next to him? He's been in jail for all this time. What would it be like? He's a big fellow. And then she made the choice and sat next to him and she said to Jeanette, what a lovely man. Because he's growing to be like Jesus. And he looks, he don't just, isn't he? I mean, I was sitting with him in the library the other day and he's beaming Jesus, you know, guys coming and saying hi to me and then I'm introducing to them. And, and these, you know, and the guy's saying, what a lovely guy. Now, I'm not going to tell you why he's in jail, but he was not always a lovely guy. But boy, oh boy, God transforms. And that's the wonderful message. We have a privilege. Know your message. Live out 
the transforming work of the gospel. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy. You know, I listened to him, I said, that's the fruit of the Spirit, joy. Gentleness, meekness, long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit is what God intends to place within each of us, overflowing. Why? Because that's the character of Jesus. That's the image of God reflected. And that's the objective of the gospel. The Lord bless you.